Hi, everyone. Hello, hello. Welcome to today's seminar. Everyone in person here and also those who are listening to us online, thank you all for joining. It's a great pleasure to have here with us Professor Xiang Feng Duan from UCLA, Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry. Uh, since 2008, Professor Duan, Professor Duan has been at UCLA. Uh, and prior to that, he completed he, his PhD at Harvard University and for a few years has been a founding scientist at uh, NanoSys, which is a startup that largely started based on his uh, PhD work. His research focuses on nanomaterials, nano devices, and their applications for future of electronic and energy technologies. And because of his great contributions and pioneering work to nanoscience and technology, Professor Duan has been uh, recognized uh, largely with many, many awards, the most recent one being the IEEE Pioneer Award in Nanotechnology. He's also currently an elected fellow of Royal Society of Chemistry and a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Before I hand the mic over to Professor Duan, just a couple of reminders. People in the room, feel free to ask questions throughout the talk. There's also going to be a Q&A session at the end. Those online, you can type your question through the Q&A option of the webinar, and we are going to read them and we can ask them on your behalf. So with that, thank you very much for being here today. We're very excited to learn about your work. Okay, thank you. Thank you. It is my great pleasure to be back at Cambridge and uh, to meet some old friends and new friends. It's very exciting to see the brand new building on MIT Nano and it's extraordinary facility and uh, meet with all the students and know uh, in fact they know about the exciting work. So I, I will take this chance to introduce some of the efforts that have been going on mostly uh, I guess mostly in the, over the past uh, five years or so. So, so uh, uh, it's going to cover a relatively broad topic uh, it's, but centered around it. So use a one of us both as a unique approach to integrate different materials and hopefully create new opportunities. So uh, we know uh, the semiconductor technology has really transformed our life over the past uh, half century or so, that's including the field effect transistors, high electron mobility transistors set for computing and communication, diode for lighting, LED and uh, for lighting and certainly for uh, solar cells. So all this, behind all this technology, the, the material foundation is actually the heterostructural or superlattice between different materials. So traditionally, we grow this material use so-called chemical integration or epitextual growth. We use chemical bond to integrate two different materials together. So because this material integrated with chemical bond, there's a certain constraints. First of all, they have to have a, a, a proper lattice match. If the, uh, if the, uh, the lattice is the same, uh, or with very minimal difference, they can have a little, little perfect interface. But if, if, if we have a small difference, uh, even just a few percent, for example, between silicon and gallium acid, we start to see defects at the interface. And very often, this interface is actually is not limited to the, uh, in, uh, this defect is not limited to the interface. They can actually propagate through the Intel architecture layer, basically to form this uh, thread uh, dislocations. So uh, this certainly can put a lot of constraints on what the materials we can put together. And additionally, actually to make this chemical application growth, usually we have to do them at a relatively high temperature. So uh, even we have a perfect lattice matching, if we do this at a high, uh, relatively high temperature, they actually start to have a atomic diffusion. Uh, into diffusion, basically you form this alloy interface with, uh, without a sharp interface. So this certainly also can compromise the structure we originally wanted. So it's, it's actually extremely difficult to get the structure you exactly wanted. So for this to, go, to grow any structure, actually just to optimize any structure very often takes years of effort and a lot of very expensive equipment. And for this reason, actually, if we look at all this powerful or technologies, actually it's really limited to a few selected materials. And, and so that mostly silicon based uh, transistors or three file based uh, materials. So, we don't really have a lot of, uh, uh, we don't normally use a lot of other materials simply because actually uh, it's actually, it's very difficult to get a very uh, a good interface between uh, uh, other materials. So uh, 
So basically, we, we would think of how can we actually really achieve a head structure that actually with designed composition modulation, with designed electronic interface. And so uh, uh, if we could achieve that, so certainly that can uh, open up new possibilities. And uh, unfortunately, as we just mentioned, it is actually has been very difficult with traditional source state materials or architectural process, very often we get what we get uh, with limited capability. So uh, this has been the case over the past half, half century or so, but so, uh, certainly uh, over the past uh, 10, 15 years or so, there's a, uh, a uh, uh, basic a surge of interest in this so-called two-dimensional atomic crystals or two-dimensional layered materials. So with these materials actually, uh, they have this covalent bonded uh, atomic layers that uh, are uh, basically, and they have together uh, through one of us uh, interactions and uh, with, uh, in this case, actually, this one of us bonded atomic layers can be actually separate into individual layers and uh, to form a single or few atom layers. With, a sing, with this single or few atom layers, actually, it's uh, very different from traditional uh, 3D materials. Actually, they have fully saturated surface. If they have fully saturated surface, basically, they can still largely maintain their electronic properties, even if they have a, a single or few atomic layers. So. Uh, with this actually uh, uh, opens a lot of opportunity in particularly actually trying to uh, think about try to uh, combine different atomic layers. Basically we can export them into individual layers and then restack them into different atomic layers and certainly this have uh, excited a lot of interest in the community. Uh, 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 basically when we stack any two material together we create a new material and it's just actually with nearly perfect interface. And, and certainly there's a lot of this over the uh, uh, past uh, 10 years or so, and a more recent highlight is actually happened at uh, MIT with this magic angle graphene that's really re uh, uh, basically the uh, excitement on graphene and uh, relative uh, uh, related uh, uh, physics behind that. So uh, uh, although the community has been largely uh, uh, focused on 2D height structure, this, uh, this, this type of height structure constructed from 2D materials, but if we look at the fundamental force behind that, actually it really relies on one of us uh, interaction between these atomic layers. And we know the one of us interaction actually is really rather general uh, uh, interaction virtually be, be, uh, between any two materials, any two molecules when they are brought together with you know, uh, a certain distance, slightly uh, larger than bounded distance, basically uh, within one of us gap. Uh, uh, with the one of us distance. Uh, so uh, they actually, they could actually have, uh, uh, even though they, they appear to be a relative weak mayo compared uh, with the conventional uh, uh, covalent bond uh, uh, of your other magnitude the weaker, but actually the force between two perfect one of us interfaces is actually rather strong. If you have, have that, uh, that one of us interaction actually could, uh, the perfect interaction one of us uh, uh, interaction could actually really uh, hold two uh, bulk material together without gravitational movement. So this actually uh, approach could, uh, in principle, apply to uh, virtually any type of uh, uh, materials uh, uh, when they are properly done. And uh, uh, in fact, actually, my group has been largely focused on this uh, one of us integration beyond the 2D materials. Actually, this really happens almost uh, in parallel with the uh, 2D one of us height structure. We can see 2D one of us height structure uh, uh, I would say it's uh, very original work started from basically use a, a 2D hexagonal nitrate as a substrate as encapsulation layer for graphene that actually can give us a, a, an ideal environment for graphene to achieve very high mobility uh, under ambient conditions. So uh, uh, around a similar time, actually, uh, I, I call this a passive surface because there's no charge transport between this one of us interface. So around similar time, actually slightly earlier, we start to use this similar approach, basically physical lamination, peak of lamination approach to integrate the graphene uh, with the uh, uh, dielectrics to actually to, uh, to, uh, to get a nearly perfect uh, uh, graphene dielectric interface uh, to actually to, uh, to uh, make a very high speed uh, transistors from uh, uh, monolayer graphene. And a few years uh, later, uh, uh, with, uh, the, within 2D community, we start to actually look at the charge transfer across this one of us interface, uh, including initial work by Lovas Love and, and the uh, vertical tunnel transistors. Actually, at that time, we also, uh, uh, on a similar time, we were working on this uh, graphing MH2 so called vertical field effect transistors. Basically, in the, all this, uh, later on, there's another work in terms of uh, this uh, 
different heterostructures uh, or diodes among these uh, different PMD materials. And so this actually kind of a functional interface because there is charge transport, charge transport across the one of us interface. So uh, uh, basically in parallel, basically we start to explore this one of us integration or, or approach to actually to, uh, to integrate 2D materials with some, uh, for example, to uh, make contact electrode. Uh, that's uh, important to, for any uh, semiconductor devices, basically to use the one of us integration to, in particular to make contact for 2D materials. And, uh, and so that also we actually also use one of us for, for some of this large error syndrome, we call them one of us syndrome that have very unique attributes. It's kind of highly stretchable and flexible as well as adaptable. So uh, from the, uh, uh, around 2018 uh, onwards, there's just a lot of excitement uh, in terms of uh, actually creating total new material as uh, this uh, magic uh, angle graphene and also then it's just other uh, 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 more patterns between different 2D materials and uh, opens a total new material platform for physics study. And uh, uh, on related topic, we actually, we have been working on this so-called uh, one of us uh, super lattices. Basically, uh, we can actually uh, integrate or insert the different molecules between these atomic layers that actually can tune the local potential modulation or tune the, uh, uh, the coupling between the mole molecular layers and the 2D layers actually create a totally new artificial solid that can, that actually very exciting for us right now. So I'm I'll try to uh, uh, briefly so we are on these three uh, different topics in terms of one of us context, one of us symptom, and one of us surplus uh, today. So let me start with this one of us head structure. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, this to make this one of us head structure be on 2D is actually uh, it's not just simply we want to make it beyond 2D, it's actually practically important. And because actually, if we want to explore a, a, a 2D material into a functional devices, so very often we actually have to integrate them with other materials. And so one, one particular excitement uh, about uh, uh, this 2D semiconductors, actually their potential uh, uh, material uh, for, uh, for uh, uh, transistor scanning. For example, as we can see from this, uh, 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 diagram here we can see, even though we have continued scanning of silicon electronics uh, and uh, over the uh, past half, half century, so and with the technology load go to five nanometer, three nanometer. But if we look at their uh, current film fed or the critical dimension, uh, uh, they are actually roughly uh, 16 nanometers, so very difficult to scale down. And uh, the three nanometer is actually nominal number of uh, only there's no physical meaning behind that. So the physical length of our device is around 50 nanometers or so, so. And if you look at the thin waist, they're almost limited by around six, seven nanometers. So this is very difficult to scale. The photo scheme does seriously compromise the uh, electronic properties. In this regard, actually 2D semiconductor actually can offer some very exciting opportunity. If we look at, particularly if we look at the, uh, we look at the silicon uh, mobility as a function of cyclic, so they, they start to degrade, rapidly when they below five, five nanometers. On the other hand, for 2D materials, actually the mobility can be largely maintained and down to like a sub nanometer regime. And this actually with such a small, uh, such a thin channel actually allows us to make a much short uh, channel transistors uh, uh, basically still retain their good switchability. So this is certainly one exciting uh, promise from the 2D material component, uh, uh, 2D material research point of view but actually to really to realize uh, 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 high performance transistors from uh, uh, 2D crystals, actually there's a lot of a challenge because uh, actually we have to integrate them with other critical uh, device components that include the source electrode, drain electrode and gate dielectrics and gate electrode. And we actually have to integrate them in a highly precise manner to, uh, to really demonstrate high performance transistors. Uh, unfortunately, the traditional integration approach, uh, for example, so for silicon electronics, deposition, oxidation, etching, is usually very difficult to uh, apply to 2D material or we can force this approach very often that introduce defects to uh, 2D crystals uh, actually compromise their electronic properties. So uh, for example, to make a good transistor, obviously we need to make good contact uh, between the uh, uh, semiconductor and metal. And that's actually certainly is a common challenge, not just for uh, 2D, uh, 2D transistors, actually even the common challenge for silicon transistors. That's still active research topic for the current silicon industries. We always want to minimize the contact resistance, by, particularly when we string uh, the device to the smaller and smaller scale. So very often actually, 
to um, when we try to make a contact, basically when we try to make a metal electrode on semiconductor, and uh, depends on the uh, relative work function and uh, the bending or name it as the form of this so-called shellac barrier, and uh, so this shellac barrier actually in principle. Uh, from the basic physics point of view, the shellac barrier should uh, basically for given semiconductor, the shellac barrier should scale with the work function metal, basically uh, scales with the band offset here. Uh, but it, actually, in reality, yeah, even in current silicon electronics, this scale uh, doesn't uh, practically devices doesn't really follow this scale. So uh, uh, in the ideal case, we should have a slope of the work uh, the barrier height was work function, which should expect slope of one. But uh, actually, in silicon electronics. Basically, the slope is typically around 0.3 or so. Uh, in getting mass and actually, the slope is actually is almost essentially flat. What this means is actually, no matter what metal we are using, we get the same barrier height. This is actually really because actually the, at the interface, we have a lot for interfacial uh, uh, trapping states and uh, interfacial defects. And for example, this is a typical uh, interface between titanium and silicon, even though we thought we have a titanium on silicon. But what we really have is actually we have unknown material in between. So that actually dominates the uh, the charge transport across this interface in traditional devices. So th this is certainly a challenge for silicon and how do we actually address this challenge in silicon electronics? So we actually we cannot use this work function matching approach to get a zero barrier head contact in the in the conventional silicon electronics. We actually uh, try to. Uh, uh, implant a lot of dopants into the contact region. In this case, we could actually shrink the barrier to, into a uh, very small uh, uh, width. In this case, actually, we normally we create a tunneling contact. That's how we do our contact with our silicon electronics today. So, uh, so uh, but unfortunately, if we try to make a good contact on 2D materials, it's actually very difficult to uh, apply this uh, the doping approach or the high doping approach because Simply, we don't have sufficient physics space. We don't have sufficient physics space to incorporate a sufficient number of uh, dopants that actually that allow us to uh, shrink the uh, barrier height to, uh, to small upper region to get a high, uh, low, uh, low barrier uh, contact. So uh, to get a uh, narrow enough con uh, tunnel contact. So uh, then we ask ourselves, can we actually go back to this so-called work function matching approach to get a, a low barrier uh, contact? So this actually can be potentially interesting because in this uh, uh, 4D materials, I actually could have this opportunity because unlike the traditional 3D semiconductor, so we always have a surface dangling bound. Here we actually have an intrinsically saturated surface. So so then this opportunity is actually uh, realized by the community, uh, at, at least appreciated by the community uh, uh, for quite a while. Actually, uh, just like a ten years or start ten years ago, people start to look at this problem. They actually try to use different work function methods, for example, to make contact to MOS two. So, uh, uh, but uh, uh, unfortunately, what is the final out actually? Uh, the final basically they have this uh, slope uh, because the interface parameter basically is the 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 barrier height versus. Uh, 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 the work function metal, the slope is around 0 0.1. Basically, have, we have very serious beam network pinning effect, uh, as basic as bad as a uh, gadium arsenide and you know, even much worse than uh, silicon. So, uh, uh, so then this uh, this has been uh, uh, intriguing, and but unfortunately, this is so common for our semiconductor community anyway, because almost it's universal. Uh, when we make any contact, we, we have a beam network pinning effect. It's intriguing, but it's not surprising. So uh, actually, in, in this case, actually, uh, we had uh, some early effort to, when we do it dielectric integration. We know if we de deposit dielectrics on top of a graphene, actually, uh, we could actually seriously compromise their uh, mobility. We, in this case, actually, we deposit metal on top of uh, the 2D semiconductor. We can imagine we have this highly energetic atoms bombarded this atomic surface. They could actually spot off a few atoms and create a surface defects that actually to uh, 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 tra interfacial trap states. So uh, uh, with this uh, somewhat naive uh, intu uh, intuition, we, we start thinking maybe we could actually apply this uh, so-called one of us integration approach and or this uh, transfer nomination approach uh, uh, to make the contact. So. Uh, uh, this is sort of unconventional to, uh, approach to make contact. Where well, in previously, when we try to make contact, we try to have a strong chemical bond. In this case, actually, instead of having a strong chemical bond between metal and semiconductor, we actually try to minimize the uh, bonding between uh, uh, between metal and semiconductor. So in this case, uh, if we look at the uh, 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 
basically, in this case, we, we fiber electrode and sacrificial substrate, uh, or typical silicon wafer, and then we could peel off the electrode and then transfer them on top of a uh, MOS2. And if we look at the structure of this uh, transport interface versus, uh, versus the deposit interface, we can quickly find out the clear difference here. For the deposit interface, we, ha we, we have a relative disordered interface. Actually, this uh, disorder is not just on the top surface and it actually could penetrate down a few atomic layers. And, but for the transfer interface, we see a very sharp uh, interf uh, interface between the transfer of gold electrode and MS2. So we can do this with a, a, a number of different metals and then try to determine their, work, uh, their uh, shock barrier height. And it, so in comparison, we can find out actually, we can the, uh, the, the shock barrier height actually scales very well with the metal work function with a slope of zero to one. And in contrast, if we use a uh, deposition to make a same contact, actually the slope around the point one. So, so, so this really highlights actually with this uh, uh, so-called one of us, uh, 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 integration approach, we could actually really maintain a, a pinny free interface or last uh, to achieve this uh, 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 mode shock and limit, uh, basically achieve the other ideal doubt. So, to achieve this type of the ideal doubt actually is, 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 is not just from fundamental or static point of view, is, uh, interesting, it's also uh, practically can be very uh, important because actually, again, as we mentioned, it, 2D, it's very difficult uh, to control the doping in 2D materials. So traditional in silicon electronics, when we try to create a P-channel, N-channel devices, we try to dope them uh, with a P-type dopant or uh, N-type dopant. But for uh, 2D materials, we don't have a good way, at least we don't have a good way to do that so far. So how can we achieve P-channel, N-channel devices? Actually, in this case, we, we don't have to Dope the uh, channel. We actually we could, we could actually simply use a contact with a uh, low work function metal match with the connection band to have n channel device and uh, or, or contact with a high work function metal to match with uh, the uh, witness band to have a p channel device. And this is actually what we demonstrated. Basically, for example, uh, MOS2, we can get a very decent performance uh, for both p channel and n channel by simply varied work function metal. And so then, actually, again, to uh, the ability to make this ideal contact actually allows us to. Uh, uh, prove a lot for more intrinsic properties. For example, in another study, we actually use this one of us contact, we could actually make ideal contact for, uh, for, the, for, for photo diode. In this case, basically minimizes the interfacial trap states and allows us actually to study their photo response behavior. And uh, also we have additional gate voltage to tune the photo carrier, uh, uh, basically the exciton carrier interaction and that our, everything can be Precisely measured and modeled and compared with the photophysics parameters. Actually, uh, the, the device measurement fully consistent with the basic photophysics measurement that allows us to really probe the limit of this type of devices. So then, uh, this type of one of us contact is really not limited to two D materials. We could actually apply them to other uh, uh, delicate materials. For example, proof of scale materials are. Uh, uh, very exciting materials have attracted a lot of interest in uh, for uh, uh, photovoltaics LEDs, but it's also very delicate material. And uh, if we actually try to study the ele electronic properties, of, uh, uh, try to make electric on proof scale materials, actually, uh, for example, use a conventional approach to deposit electric on proof scale materials, actually, we can see we could actually create an entire amorphous layer that, uh, that can extend our couple of tens of nanometers uh, in cyclics. And uh, on the other hand, if we try to use one of us uh, uh, kind of approach, we could actually create the atomic uh, clean interface. The damage can also be highlighted within this uh, uh, basic PL image. So if we can say if we deposit the contact on top of uh, the approval scale and we could try to peel off an electrode because strong bonding actually is uh, difficult to peel off, occasionally we'll peel off electrode after peel off electrode, optically we don't see a difference between the area with the electrode and without the electrode. But if you look at the PL imaging, actually we see the, the area that was originally under the deposit electrode actually is completely dark. That really shows that this deposition approach is really completely quenched the, uh, the PL of the material, under, underlying material. On the other hand, if we one of us transfer and then peel them off, because of the weak bonding, we can easily peel them off. And after the peel off, actually we can see the PL image actually so that there's really no difference between the area with electrode and without electrode. So uh, we, we went further on to try to actually, we can uh, transfer the Intel, the whole bus structure actually to uh, do the uh, electric transport studies. So we can see there's a very clear difference under the exact same condition with the one of us contact and the 
typical the deposit contact is the current is actually a difference is already two to three orders magnitude. Basically, that means basically use the, the deposit contact, everything we measured is, is the contact instead of intrinsic properties. And uh, this one of us contact actually they can actually uh, maintain that linear behavior down to like a, uh, a really low the cryogenic temperature. So actually this also allows, gives us probability, a possibility to probe the electronic properties of this type of material down to very low temperature that has actually has not been even studied at all. And if, if we look at the contact resistance, uh, you know, basically the whole bar, um, uh, photo mean whole bar measurement, we can derive the contact resistance and we can say one of us contact actually two to three orders magnitude smaller than the, uh, uh, the deposit contact. and. It, because we can probe the low temperature behavior, we can actually really probe, it. for example, the carry mobility, it actually can reach up to the 2000. And it's also re uh, reveals some very intriguing behavior. For example, this photo current, uh, uh, photo connectance measurement shows actually that we have very non nasty photo carriers. That photo carriers are basically nasty for days, not, not the seconds or hours, for days without the apparent uh, 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 decrease. Uh, after we turn off the net. And so that is actually uh, related to some kind of a, a polarizing effect with this type of materials. And it's certainly very interesting physics to be probed uh, uh, there. So beyond this type of transfer of metal contact, and there's also other approaches maybe uh, to make a, a, a one of us contact, uh, basically uh, uh, we start to explore, uh, uh, use a 2D one of us metal actually directly grows this one of us metal onto uh, uh, semiconductors and uh, the 2D semiconductors. And so basically uh, we use, a, a, for example, a have a larger area 2D semiconductors and we can actually uh, use a laser to uh, create defects and create a nucleation side for the 2D metal growth. And to, uh, actually in this case, we can grow up a periodic arrays of 2D metals onto the, uh, onto the 2D semiconductors. Uh, and, uh, if we look at the interface the, uh, between the CVD grow, uh, 2D metal and 2D semiconductor, we can say we have a very clean interface. And uh, what's exciting here is actually with this 2D metal contact uh, here, actually we can get, get a very high current density. And in this case, actually uh, initial study, uh, uh, the, for 1.8 micron channel device, we have a current density almost one million per micrometer. That's, a, that's, a very, uh, that's uh, actually, uh, 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 very high if we consider the non channel lens, and we can also actually scale this down to like uh, 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 tens of an hour or hundreds of nanometer regime. We can say basically we have a, a, a 2D metal and a 2D uh, semiconductor here. By scaling the uh, channel lens down, we could actually achieve much higher current density, actually beyond 1.7 millimeter per micrometer. Uh, this is already a 20 nanometer channel device. So this is actually really comparable or even exceeds silicon. Uh, in, in electronics uh, at the similar channel lengths. So, uh, so then uh, uh, on the other hand, we can, in this case, we could actually achieve very good contact. And I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of excellent work going on at MIT as well, using this uh, 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 semi metal uh, business contact, for example. And uh, this is actually a very exciting area uh, uh, nowadays. I, I think the, 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 the recent, recent progress really shows that this 2D semiconductor have a lot of potential. And certainly was a lot more effort on that. So, so then here we, we, we talk about how, to, how do we use a one of us contact to make it really perfect, uh, perfect contact. On the other hand, the dielectric is also another challenge. For example, uh, in, the, in, in this case, we always rely on back gate. Uh, we need relative high gate voltage uh, and basic because of it, it's difficult to actually to integrate high quality dielectrics. For, uh, for example, if we try to deposit, high, uh, deposit dielectrics on top of a uh, uh, this type of short channel devices, uh, we could certainly uh, uh, greatly reduce the uh, gate, uh, voltage, uh, uh, but on the other hand, the current density also uh, kind of sacrifice a little bit. So it's essentially because of uh, some uh, 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 damage, potential damage created on this uh, 2D semiconductor channel. I uh, use a similar approach actually, basically use, we could actually create this uh, uh, metal contact and gate stack uh, entire uh, a stack on sacrificial substrate and then transfer the entire stack, including the uh, source drain contact and get a, a stack onto the uh, semiconductor, we could actually expand this approach to basically to create uh, for dielectric integration. In this case, for example, we integrate uh, uh, yttrium oxide dielectric on top of MOS2. We, we can see they have very clean interface with, with no appreciable defects. And with this, we could actually really uh, uh, achieve the other ideal substrate of the vein. And that is uh, certainly important for the uh, next level of uh, 
uh, to for the push performance of this type of devices. So uh, I guess uh, uh, that's basically uh, uh, a few examples on, in terms of one of us height structure. Uh, I, uh, in the next uh, topic, I tried to uh, go a little, a little more complex, basically instead of a single height structure interface, but we could actually use one of us first to create a more complex structure. In this case, with multiple interfaces, we call them one of us super lattices. So conventionally, we use exfoliation and restack approach, or this transfer lamination approach to create this type of height structures. It has been tremendously flexible and allows us to create a, a lot of artificial hydrostructure interfaces to probe their inner current purpose. But if we try to uh, actually extend this approach beyond the two or a few repeating units, it become increasingly difficult, uh, particularly with traditional exfoliation and restacking approaches, because each transfer and restack have a certain yield. You can think about if you, if you have 90% yield for one transfer, eventually you're gonna have less than 10% yield if you did 10 period of uh, materials. So this actually uh, 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 got asked to uh, ask whether we could actually uh, develop a more scalable approach to actually to do this type, to create this type of uh, structures with uh, multiple uh, or high order uh, structure with uh, multiple interfaces. Basically, how can we really uh, build up this high order superlattices beyond a few repeating units? So my first approach we explored actually started from one single head structure. Simply basically we can grow a height value and then somehow allow them to roll up. If we look at this structure, this, uh, this structure itself, basically after rolling up, basically we have this alternative layer of two different materials. So the, how do we do this? Basically we start from CVD growth. We first have a, a one layer, for example, a WSE2, and then on top of that, it could grow another 2D layer King S2. Uh, uh, after that, actually, we, uh, we uh, expose this uh, 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 material on, uh, into a certain, uh, a certain electrolyte. In this case, a basic water isomer mixture that actually can intercalate, intercalate below in between the substrate, silicon oxide and 2D materials that actually can peel off, essentially delaminate the 2D materials and because of surface tension and uh, naturally, uh, naturally rolling up into this uh, uh, nano scrolls or roll up structure, if, uh, basically. Uh, so, uh, so this basically it shows uh, uh, the image of uh, the uh, the hydro, uh, hydro, uh, basically the, the mono layer, hydro bilayer, and and uh, after the I guess the font got offset a little bit after the run up to form this nano scrolls. And if you look at the uh, cross section EM, you can see they have a, uh, a roll up structure. And uh, if you look at the high resolution image, you can clearly see. Alternative layer of materials is the WS2 uh, 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 SNS2, and it, it's just a highly periodic structure and it's a highly odd structure with periodicity with very, very narrow uh, uh, distribution periodicity. So, this actually really creates a totally new, uh, you can see it's a really totally new artificial material. Uh, 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 so, uh, what can we do with it? So, obviously, when we roll them up, you can, you can start to question whether they change the electronic properties. Uh, uh, optic properties or not. And so uh, our collaborator have asked, uh, did some uh, uh, calculation, but, but what we find out actually for hydro barrier, we is uh, actually type, type two alignment have a small, relative small band gap. And then for after the running up, actually the, uh, the band structure changes type three uh, uh, alignment basically have a likely band gap, but basically they become more or less they become metallic. And so this actually, uh, so also reflected in our uh, transport measurement uh, for the, uh, basically for the same, uh, uh, same dimension uh, uh, device, uh, if a belly also the actions are so very good as uh, semiconductor properties and for uh, uh, for the uh, 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 after the roll up as uh, the conductivity increased by a few orders magnitude uh, with a very weak gate modulation. And we can also certainly derive the uh, carry mobility and a uh, carry density basically increased by two to three orders magnitude. And uh, another intricate uh, 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 observation that actually after roll up actually to show very different uh, magnetic uh, 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 transport properties after uh, before running up, we have this quadratic dependence on the magnetic field, magnetic resistance. After running up, they actually have a linear uh, dependence uh, uh, with the uh, uh, magnetic field that shows actually indicates some non trivial topological uh, effect going on here. But that certainly uh, uh, could be a very interesting material for further uh, uh, studies, and we haven't got a chance to further probe that. But just from the material perspective, actually, this approach is rather general. We can roll up a lot of different structures. Uh, 
heterobilials, heterotrilials. Uh, for example, here we show the uh, 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 material with three different compositions. Uh, WS2, MOS2, uh, TNS2, uh, actually two layer of TNS2 to have this, uh, to roll up to have this highly ordered structure. Or you can uh, roll up, for example, uh, 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 WS2 barrier, WS2 on top of that with deposited uh, aluminum oxide with the ELD, and you roll up the entire structure, you actually have this uh, semiconducting, uh, uh, basically semiconducting and, uh, and uh, insulating, rolling up this. Uh, maybe actually interesting to think about if uh, uh, for, for the transistor. Uh, application point of view, actually, uh, it can be actually multiple channel, multiple sheet transistor, something like that, that can be potentially uh, started from uh, that direction. So then we could actually uh, uh, do this with a lot of other uh, materials. The materials, for example, intrinsic, with intrinsic federal mechanism with intrinsic uh, uh, superconductivities uh, that allows us to tune the dimensionality to tune the uh, electron correlations within these type of systems. And another, uh, 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 tunability is actually, uh, we know this hydrobalios, they have intrinsic uh, uh, more structure. And after rolling up, they can actually develop a new carrier angle depends on the exact rolling up direction. So this is, again, uh, give us a, 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 a very flexible lobby to tune the resulting materials. And uh, we can see if they can have different carrier angles and uh, with different more uh, structures and, and certainly, uh, could be a very exciting material for uh, for the studies. Um, so, uh, uh, as I mentioned, basically this roll-up stretch actually allows us to actually to really integrate this uh, uh, solid-state two-dimensional materials uh, with two-dimensional materials or with uh, some simple materials into this uh, higher-order superlight structures or or or, or, uh, or so-called artificial materials. So. Next question we are going to ask us, uh, actually, can we actually even go beyond the solid state building block, go beyond the 2D building blocks? So uh, from this perspective, we think about it, the materials are available to us. Uh, we cannot just classify two different materials, uh, two different classes, one is solid state material. Uh, usually they have uh, a very well defined uh, uh, crystal structure. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, because of high order structure, very often they have uh, uh, excellent electronic properties. But on the other hand, for solid state materials, very much we, very often we get what we get. We don't have much room to tune their composition, their structure. Uh, for example, uh, most of uh, uh, most of uh, solid state materials uh, yeah, very difficult to achieve chirality because of uh, intrinsic light symmetry. And on the other hand, the another class of material. Uh, I'm, uh, I have a chemistry background. And certainly, we know it's, we can use chemistry to actually almost actually create di a different type of molecular structure, a different uh, a molecular structure with different functional groups. So this have a huge uh, room uh, of tunability and uh, a lot of functionality. But on the other hand, if we're trying to expose this material for, uh, for example, for electronics, they very often they don't because they don't have a non-ring order, and they typically have very poor electronic properties and uh, so in this case, uh, we thought whether we could actually combine these two type material together to create uh, to uh, to maybe uh, to create a uh, uh, to create a new type of material. In this case, basically, uh, uh, this uh, atomic layers, uh, this crystal atomic layers, that could actually provide an ideal template for self-assemble of uh, 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 different molecules uh, on top of them, in between them. And this is because of uh, between this uh, 2D crystals, uh, crystalline, uh, crystalline atomic layers and the self same models, we don't have a covalent bond. And that's actually give us a, a room to actually to uh, change different molecular systems without affecting their structure and, uh, and, and just modulate their properties. So my only example we did on this is actually just use a rather passive molecule uh, called a C-type molecule. It's almost like tetraammonium salt. It's almost the, the molecule we use in our soaps. So, uh, so it's, uh, we could actually use an electrochemical uh, intercalation approach to actually basically inject the uh, uh, electrons into, uh, for example, in this case, into, into black phosphorus and negative charge of black phosphorus that actually can attract the positive charge of the tetraammonium salt uh, into this uh, a uh, bandwidth gap actually in between the self uh, assemble into highly ordered uh, monolayers. And we can see this actual TM image of the intrinsic uh, uh, black phosphorus. And after intercalation, you can see the atomic structure of black phosphorus is very, very well retained. And in between, we have a, a layer of molecules. And we can see they actually have a highly uniform uh, thickness, although the structure is relatively difficult to resolve at this point. But it's, it's, we can see they have a highly ordered structure. 
uh, across a very uh, uh, basic across many many layers. And this is actually, if you compare traditional super lattices, even we have a three five percent of lattice change, we have a lot of strategic location across the different layers here because the, between these atomic layers and the molecular layers, we don't have a uh, chemical bond. The, the interfacial strain are nat naturally relaxed, so this allows us actually to really uh, maintain retain the intrinsic uh, uh, atomic structure uh, uh, well, even though they have very different molecular uh, atomic structure. And this certain allows us to, uh, to tune the electronic properties. In this case, actually, we can naturally decouple the uh, electronic coupling between the uh, black phosphorus layer to actually uh, in the uh, to achieve a molecular layer properties, even though uh, we have a a bulk material because the bulk monolayer material basically we have a bulk formatted, but they have monolayer properties. Uh, and more interesting, actually, because of this uh, uh, black phosphorus or most two D materials, they have a layer dependent uh, band gap. So you, if you can say, uh, if you think about it, have layer dependent band gap actually they depends on the uh, number of layers. They have very different conducting band edge, and so that means actually you need a very different potential to eject electrons. Uh, into this uh, 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 atomic layers and to uh, uh, for the intercalation process. So this basically you can also have a so-called staging process. Basically, you could actually uh, by control the potential, you could uh, uh, get mostly bi layer. Every two black phosphor layer have one layer of molecule, or every three black phosphor layer have one the molecule, as shown in this. Uh, uh, with, with the different intercalation and potential, we have very different band gap, very different um, and PR properties. And so then this approach actually very flexible, can be extended to uh, or virtually any kind of 2D materials. We can use a different different molecules, uh, for example, uh, with smaller, big molecules, actually they can control their basic the interlayer expansion or interlayer coupling, uh, basically with a different periodic distance. This uh, XRD pattern shows actually the intercalation materials actually shows a, Pure phase actually, you can see that the diffraction peak is also very low. That really shows that the heterostructure actually is, is really highly ordered heterostructure. So, so in this case, actually, uh, in case of uh, a TMD, we know for uh, for example, in the case of MRS2, for, uh, for multiple MRS2, they have an indirect bank gap. After intercalation, we, we actually decouple the interlayer interaction, uh, interaction. Actually, we could actually turn them into direct uh, material with a very uh, strong PL emission. In this case, actually, uh, this is sort of actually um, stronger than a single monolayer because we do have much, a lot more materials to have a lot, uh, much larger optical uh, cross section. So that uh, could potentially be interesting for practical uh, uh, devices. And so then this can be a go beyond the other materials uh, because limit time I'll skip that. So, uh, so in this case, we use this passive mole uh, molecules to decouple interlayer interaction. So the, the point is actually to really to introduce this uh, uh, molecular species into this solid state system is actually, we would ask, can we actually bring new functions to the solid state systems? Okay, not just the, uh, not just modify the uh, solid state system, uh, system, actually can we bring new functions? So uh, in this case, uh, we start to think about what new function can we bring into the system? So uh, we thought the chiralic can be a, a very interesting uh, uh, properties uh, to bring into this source of material because it's actually, it, because the intrinsic lattice symmetry is very difficult to, to design or carry uh, a solid. So, but on the other hand, in the chemistry community, I actually, we could actually make a lot of different chiral molecules. And so, uh, chiral molecules uh, uh, has been studied in chemistry community for more than a century. And, but more recently, actually, uh, so just a, a renewed interest, actually, uh, it has been suggested that chiral molecules actually uh, could actually exert a certain spin selectivity when charged transfer, transfer across chiral molecules. So we, uh, we, we thought maybe if we actually we can combine this carrier molecule or so-called carrier in this spin selectivity with, uh, with this 2D atomic layers that can give us some exciting new opportunity. So certainly this carrier in this uh, spin selectivity has tracked uh, quite a bit of interest over the past uh, uh, a few years. Actually, the first uh, suggestion I actually started about it was 20 years ago, but in general, it's uh, uh, it's getting a lot more uh, recent interesting and uh, just uh, uh, it's relatively debated topic area uh, because actually a lot of studies are actually very delicate. For example, 
some AFM studies shows actually we could have a spin polarization more than 40%, but if we use uh, in the same study, if we try to make solid state, that's a spin polarization almost negligible. So this is kind of a status of the field. Uh, also, the, there's a, in terms of the fundamental understanding behind this is also the need a real serious uh, development. Uh, if, if we actually have 46% uh, 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 selectivity, that actually really be under uh, our, our conventional understanding because of uh, this molecular systems typically have a, a, a net, at, uh, net atoms. They don't have a strong spin optical uh, 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 interaction. So, uh, so in this case, actually, uh, 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 this, uh, by inter uh, intercalate carrier molecules into this uh, 2D atomic layers actually gives us a very uh, interesting approach to investigate this problem because actually in this case, we, this carrier molecules can self-assemble between these uh, crystal atomic layers uh, to form much better ordered uh, molecular layers. Additionally, these molecular layers actually are protected by the crystal atomic layers. And this crystal atomic layers function as a natural contact to probe the charge transfer across the molecular layers. So the intercalation process is rather straightforward. And if, so after the intercalation, we can see the clear lattice expansion uh, from the print, uh, pristine to the, uh, uh, to the intercalate material and uh, with the uh, cyclic uh, almost doubles. And the, uh, the intrinsic lattice structure of the 2D is, uh, is maintained. So basically just no structure damage to the 2D. And uh, if we look at the uh, Raman spectrum, basically after uh, intercalation, we actually have a stronger uh, Raman uh, uh, resonance actually that indicates, uh, probably indicates a stronger electrophone interaction in this type of uh, monolayer structure. And uh, uh, so then uh, if we look at the uh, circular dichroism, that's uh, one way to characterize uh, the, the chirality we can see after intercalation, we actually we see clear CD signal that actually really conforms to these molecules, uh, uh, scalar molecules that are intercalated between these two. Uh, atomic layers and their chirality are maintained uh, uh, in this uh, uh, superlight structure. So uh, uh, next we try to actually try to look at the, how uh, the spin selectivity. We created this uh, so a spin tunneling device. Uh, uh, basically, we use a ferromagnet to polarize uh, the uh, 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 this uh, spin. Basically, uh, the spin of injected electrons and see how they polarize electron transfer across this superlight structure. We can quickly find as, uh, actually with this. Uh, 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 spin polarized electrons actually depends on the chirality, they have very different transfer properties. For example, in one chirality, they, they have a higher current at electric magnetic field, uh, and in the other chirality, they have totally opposite behavior. And uh, for the, this magnetic loop study, basically shows that we actually we have clear magnet, uh, basically the, uh, the, uh, the spin selectivity here, and uh, we could further quantify the uh, at the spin polarization ratio or a magnetic resistance ratio that actually really fast is the state of art uh, devices made from this type of uh, 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 carrier molecules. So this is actually very exciting for us. Actually, this is really, uh, uh, think about it, we have a, a huge number of 2D crystals and have all kinds of molecules and that uh, 2D crystal can be semiconducting, can be metal, can be the superconductor and the certain molecules itself can have a uh, carrier, can be carrier, maybe have a magnetic function or some particular peculiar optical function. So this actually uh, could actually give us a, 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 a big room uh, to uh, to play to really to combine these different materials together to create a, a new material systems. And uh, uh, we have been actually trying to push forward in this uh, respect. And uh, for example. Uh, we could actually uh, integrate different 2D uh, materials with different type of molecules, or and it uh, certainly gives us a way to tune their superconductive properties, to tune their ferromagnetic properties, and and uh, so uh, I guess uh, uh, in general, uh, and this is uh, certainly gives us a huge room to actually to create a new artificial material. So uh, I guess uh, uh, my time probably is how much time do I have? We've been running out of time. Okay, uh, okay. I, I'll try to finish over in five minutes. So I briefly introduce, introduce one last topic is called one of us thin films. So uh, we know we use this one of us force to create uh, the hydrostructures and the uh, uh, high order super lattices. Actually, we could actually expose this one of us interaction between 2D atomic layers to create this type of so-called solution process 2D thin films. So we have this atomic layers disposed in a solution. And then you could use a printing or spin coating process to process them into thin film. 
So this symphony, you have this uh, basically have this staggered uh, 2D sheet. If you look at this uh, uh, schema, uh, illustration of this stack sheet, basically between different sheets, you actually have this one of us interface with uh, minimum interfacial trap states actually that could allow us to have very good chat transfer across the uh, different nano sheet, even though they are processed from solution because we don't have a lot of uh, interfacial trap states. So uh, this actually, uh, we demonstrated the concept a few years ago by, uh, uh, by basically the mega high quality 2D nano sheet ink to actually, the, the, that can be easily spinkled to large areas in film. And actually, they form a very decent uh, with uh, with a very decent electronic power. Uh, for example, the carry mobility around ten to thirty centimeter square uh, uh, per watt per second. What uh, and certainly because we can process over over large area, you can I start to think about some kind of circuit design. But but what more interesting is actually the same film actually is unlike a conventional inorganic same film. Because we have this stacked nano sheet, you can think about it, you have a stacked nano sheet with one of us both. If you try to push them, if you try to push them, the nano sheet actually can slide on top of each other uh, without breaking their electric contact. So this actually gives us, us a possibility to create a stretchable uh, thin film. Uh, this can, so can be uh, illustrated in this uh, animation here. You, as you push it, you can maintain the structure integrated. On the other hand, if we actually have a CVD grow thin film, typically actually you have stitched uh, uh, domains. If you try to stretch them, they actually they, they break apart. So, uh, so, so what we can see, uh, this is basically the structure of uh, uh, the typical staggered nano sheet thin film. We have uh, this freestanding thin film uh, about 30 nanometer or so on top of floating on top of water. And in comparison, if we try to float in freestanding CVD thin film, actually they, they can easily break up. This is actually just because actually we have this, uh, uh, this sliding uh, degree of freedom, uh, even though have a local agitation, they can, the structure uh, the form can, uh, can accommodate the uh, local structure uh, 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 agitation. But on the other hand, for the CVD symphony, because of the green boundary, when you have a local structure agitation, for example, from the solution evaporation, they could actually uh, tear all part of this uh, symphony. If you look at the uh, mechanical properties, you can see uh, basically uh, they, they can stretch uh, up to like a uh, Sixty percent also without breaking, and it says so that the Young's modulus are about like uh, three orders magnitude smaller than MOS2 itself. It's just because it's simply because we are not really stretch MOS2 lattice, so we are we are actually uh, a uh, uh, make a sliding interface. You can see the uh, uh, the basically uh, stretch sixty percent without any obvious uh, uh, breaking, and here uh, we start to see some breaking. This is probably still a lot of the intrinsic limit. It's really because of a local, uh, local wicked point and local defects uh, in the same, in same film. And if we measure the conductivity, we can see the same film can be stretched up to 50% with uh, very little resistance change. And if we have a CVD same film, a few percent, they have a rapid increase of resistance. The flexibility can be highlighted here. Just here we have like a, a, a 30 nanometer uh, uh, thick one of our same film with two metal electrodes. You can see the metal electrode in comparison, metal electrode is very rigid, 50 nanometer gold electrode on top. Of it. But the, the, this, this membrane itself, you can see they can open up or close up, completely open up or close up without it tearing apart. And because they're so flexible, if you try to place them on top of a irregular topography, for example, this four micron sphere, so, uh, you can see they, actually, they can actually really adapt it to local geometry to actually wrap around the uh, uh, the spheres. Instead, if you use a CVD symphony of a same cyclist, you can see basically they, they don't have as uh, don't uh, has as good conformability or adaptability, and they can easily break up uh, in this uh, area in this regions that are, where I have a large string. And and another interesting attribute actually this one uh, this uh, stack symphony also even though they appear continuous, but actually they also uh, semi trans uh, basically it's a permeable because we have this uh, uh, staggered flakes typically around so long, uh, three nanometer in cyclists. So you have you can imagine you have this uh, uh, nanoscale channel winding around the entire same film allows the gas molecules to go from one side to the other side. Actually, if we measure the uh, water uh, transport rate across the same film, actually, the, the, at least a few times better than our uh, skin. So, uh, 
with this type of uh, uh, stretchability, we can see, uh, or, or adaptability, that can be actually offer us a very interesting material to actually to, uh, to interface irregular geometries, for example, our skin. So we know, uh, if you look at skin, it's, it's, it's a very rough surface. So obviously, if we try to uh, place a traditional sort of state semiconductor on top of that, we are not going to have a good electronic interface. So you may say, if we have a flexible piece, of, for example, uh, flex, uh, make a very thin uh, uh, a semiconductor, for example, a flex of flexible silicon membrane. It's, it, it's flexible, but still, because of irregular geometry, you cannot, we can still cannot use flexible material to actually make a conform uh, interface with this type of uh, irregular uh, uh, topography. So on the other hand, because of, uh, if we consider uh, uh, the one of us in PMG, because the adaptability, the stretchability can adapt to very uh, microscopic uh, structures actually they could really uh, behave like a fluid, almost a fluid like a uh, system to, to, uh, to, uh, uh, to adapt to a, sm a small topography to form this highly conformal interface. And this actually allows us to have a direct electronic uh, communication with a, a body signal because a small a potential change in the body actually could actually effectively modulate it or directly modulate the potential in this semiconductor channel. Basically, the creator of skin gate transistor, and this actually can allow us to actually achieve on skin signal amplification. And so uh, we can see actually, this is just one example if we transfer the, uh, the same thing on top of uh, artificial skin here. Basically, in left side is basically a freestanding one of our same film. Uh, 23 nanometer thickness in the red side actually have a, a thin film on top of a, a, a plastic uh, a PI layer of about 1.6 micrometer or so. You can see we, we, have, we have heard a lot about flexible or, uh, or, or conformal electronics, but actually the, even though microscopically they are conformal, but actually if you look at the topography after uh, even with the 1.6 micrometer, uh, that's a problem. One of the things the plastic membrane you put on skin actually is losing all these fine skin textures. But on the other hand, if you look at the uh, uh, this one of our skin film, actually skin texture is essentially the same with the bare skin. So this really gives us an extremely conformal interface. And certainly, if we pl place the mouse skin because of the structure uh, conformability, and uh, we could actually uh, repeat the stretch and squeeze them without actually flicking off. On the other hand, if we have a uh, have a CVD same film, they could easily flake off because because essentially because we can easily break them and they start to flake off, and so on skin they actually also shows a very decent uh, electronic properties because essentially it's really not dependent on substrate, and this is certainly a very big device, uh, uh, five ten micrometer device actually it just shows uh, uh, the uh, res response speed around like hundred kilohertz or so. It's, it sounds low, but it's sufficient for a lot of biologic signals. And so that if we want a higher speed that can, uh, can be achieved by scale of the device to the small dimensions. And with this, we could actually start to have direct electronic communication with our body signal and start to measure our body signal uh, 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 through this on-skin signal application. So uh, I guess uh, I just want to uh, uh, sum it up before I conclude, basically. Hopefully, with uh, this uh, 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 seminar, I uh, convince you this uh, boundless, uh, uh one of us interaction actually really gives us a lot of opportunities for uh, flexible integra integration of uh, many different materials, not just two D. Actually, it really, really goes way beyond two D. And uh, with this, actually, really gives us a, a totally new possibility to create. A, uh, new materials, and uh, that is not a previous possible with traditional solid state material, not possible with traditional molecular materials. So we, we can marry these two different materials a class together and still uh, maintain the electronic, uh, uh, electronic uh, 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 properties or the electronic order of the crystal in solid, but introduce new molecular functionality. And, and it could certainly uh, offer very rich material uh, uh, a platform for uh, fundamental physics studies and uh, a pop, very likely new opportunities for device uh, applications. I guess last day I went to uh, thank my group. And uh, so uh, certainly uh, most of the uh, work I, I discussed is really happened uh, over the past uh, five, uh, six years. So uh, certainly it's really built up uh, uh, a lot of previous generation students uh, over the years. And, uh, 
Uh, so with those in mind, I have nothing to talk about. And thank you. Thank you. Okay. Very Let's let's take three questions and then, as you know, there's a reception right after in room twelve three zero zero five. So you can, after the three questions, you can all come to the reception, and uh, Professor Duan will also be there to answer more questions. So let's take three questions. Yes. Uh, thanks so much for a very inspiring talk. Uh, for the work you did you did on molecular intercalation of the study materials, uh, my question is. Um, do we know if there is intermolecular interaction as opposed to just looking at what the host is happening, but then if the molecules are interacting to each other, giving rise to some contribution to what's happening. Mm -hmm. um, and um, for example, if I put alkali ions, they are very far from the band gap, so I don't see any kind of role there, but in these molecules which you have heavy elements, do you see any role of intermolecular interaction to affect the property of the the whole host. Okay, that's a very good question. Very good question. So, uh, so with, uh certainly we are uh, right now we ha don't have exactly uh, the uh, atomic regimen uh, or molecular regimen in between layers. That's something we really want to uh, to probe. Maybe we use micro uh, EB for example here. Uh, and so, uh, in terms of the interaction, uh, and right now, for what we studied so far, basically we don't observe inter the obvious interaction between molecules. Uh, but there's certainly the interaction, actually there are some ongoing very exciting studies. There, there will be interactions uh, between the uh, molecules and the 2D or and the atomic layers. There, there are interactions, there's some very intriguing interactions. The character may be actually projected into the 2D layers. Actually that's a totally change their uh, electronic order in 2D layers actually. Uh, that's a that's a particular exciting and uh, certainly uh, when we uh, uh, another thing is basically if we uh, uh, intercalate some molecules uh, with the magnetic centers uh, that could actually change the magnetic coupling uh, intrinsically for example the 2d itself has no magnetic uh, um, no ferromagnetism and molecule has no ferromagnetism after intercalation they actually can develop a ferromagnetism and uh, certainly right now it's still at a low temperature, but that just really indicates there are some communication uh, between 2D and molecules, and just maybe likely there could be an ordering, uh, magnetic ordering uh, within the uh, molecular layers as well, but that is, we don't have uh, any conclusive ev evidence right now. Thanks so much. Thank you. Any other questions? Hi, thank you. Thank you for a great talk. Uh, I actually uh, I wanted to ask a question uh, back in the beginning of the talk about the Schottky barrier and you know, uh, uh, your Schottky and ohm ohmic uh, mm -hmm. junctions. Mm -hmm. Generally, if we, if we think about standard PN junction theory, the barrier is only linear with the, with the work function if you assume that you have bulk reservoirs of electrons at, chemical potentials of the two materials. Mm -hmm. But if you're working at such small, you know, couple of nanometers scale, I'm wondering where, um, why, why should we, this assumption still be made? And why should we expect the barrier to be linearly dependent off the work functions? Mm -hmm. Interesting question. Uh, so, uh, okay. So uh, in general, in this case, uh, your, uh, I would say, uh, so rather, so certain first of all, they have weak, weak, weak interaction. Your, uh, basically, you don't have direct, direct chemical bond. You don't change the band structure. And so uh, it's basically in that case, uh, we, don't, we don't actually greatly modulate the, uh, for example, the, 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 the band edge position. Right, this, this, this basically uh, this barrier head should be determined by band edge position and the work function metal. So the work function metal have, we don't, we don't, of course, certainly, first of all, uh, the metal have almost infinite number of electrons. Their work function is not going to be changed so much. And secondly, for the uh, semiconductor itself, the band, band edge, if, if we don't change the structure, the band edge position is not maintained. 
So in that case, they actually can be have this really ideal band offset structure. So it's a kind of almost kind of like a molecular system. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe let's end with one question from uh, a line audience. Uh, and there's going to be time during the reception to ask more questions. So someone from Penn State, I believe, uh, is asking, can you comment for your Van der Waal contact ap uh, approach? Can you comment on reproducibility, scalability, and what is the importance of quality of the material itself? Okay, very good question. Uh, it's uh, uh, actually, it's, uh, I mean, scalability is a relative thing. Uh, it's not certainly so far it's not industry scalable, but it's actually scalable. It's, it's, it's a, we could do it on the wave scale, and hopefully, actually, for uh, for the person interested, there will be a paper appear uh, probably hopefully in one month or two or so on the scalable integration, uh, one of us integration uh, on the wave scale, and uh, the in terms of their reliability, actually, based on our experience, is far more reliable than the deposit contact. Is simply because the deposit contact we actually create defects in the atomic layers, and that defects can be chance by chance. Particularly, so I didn't show it here. Actually, certainly depends on the deposition approach. Our typical deposition approach actually really create a lot of defects in these atomic layers, and uh, we have shown that if we try to pick up uh, the metal electrode after the deposition, we pick up the underlying MS2 with the metal electrode. But not just the top layer, we pick up entire, if I have a 10 layer, we pick up a 10 layer. But for the area beyond the electrode, the left on surface. That means we have very weak bonding between the within MS2, in implant MS2 at the edge of the metal. Basically, the MS2 is almost cut, right? So if you can imagine if we have such a weak bonding that that means most of the bond is broken at the edge. If the, the bond is broken at the edge, you can imagine it can, it's a, it's a very probability thing. Sometimes you have good contact, sometimes you don't have a good contact because of how, depends on how many bonds are broken at the edge. This is very thin atomic layer, right? The quality of your material matter, the source of the 2D material you have to begin with. So uh, the effect of that compared to the effect of the contact, whether it being Van der Waal contact or deposited. I mean, I, I guess quality always matters. Of course, it always matters. If, uh, if it's intrinsic, they have a lot of trap states already, there's, then there's no way we can uh, do this. Right? We really need to have a clean material for sure. Excellent. So let's thank Professor Don again. Thank you. And hopefully, again, the reception is in 12.3005, and hopefully we'll see you all there.